You're listening to Hockey to Heroin, the road to recovery on the Hockey Podcast Network. New episodes Wednesdays and Saturdays. Follow Hockey to Heroin on Twitter. That's at Hockey, the number two heroin for updates and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Brady Leavitt, like any other Canadian kid, his dream was to play in the National Hockey League. Success came easily to Leopold as he began to turn heads in the junior league. Only pass for Long, he's got Leopold with him. Long walks in, Sanders, yeah! Leopold's a right hand shot, rotates, and then sends it along back to Leopold. Yeah! And here we go, right off the bat, a fight ensues, and it's Leopold and Kerr, and they're both getting in shots. Now Leopold throwing right after right, and just connecting like crazy. Once I met heroin, I mean, it was just, that became my new passion. What's the reason that young people who are athletes get addicted to heroin? They injure themselves, and they're more likely to be prescribed an opioid. And once addicted, Many are going to switch over to heroin because it's much more cost effective. And the effects that they produce in the brain are indistinguishable. When we talk about painkillers, we're essentially talking about heroin pills. Welcome back to another edition of Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. This is Brady Liebold coming at you guys from Utterson, Ontario, right in the heart of beautiful Muskoka. I feel very fortunate to be living where I am these days, uh, getting out on the ATV every day. I was out in the lake with the kids earlier today. Uh, very fortunate, very lucky guys uh, just to be alive and uh, very lucky uh, to be doing what I'm doing uh, right now. So thank you guys so much for all the support, for listening, for tuning in each week on Wednesdays and Saturdays on the Hockey Podcast Network. Uh, I love the Facebook comments, the Twitter, the Instagram. Uh, please keep them coming. Uh, guys, I've also added a brand new feature on the Hockey to Heroin website. That's HockeyToHeroin.com. Uh, you can scroll all the way to the bottom of the page. There is a new feature on there uh, for leaving voice messages. Now, uh, I've listened to a few other podcasts. I, I enjoy listening to podcasts. I'm an avid podcast listener myself of other podcasts. And a lot of the ones I listen to have a feature where the listeners call and they leave voicemails. And I thought this was just such a great idea. There's been such an outpour of support and I just am so grateful for that Uh, but I would really love to hear uh, voice messages Uh, I'd love to hear people's voices Uh, it's a lot more personal and I'm gonna actually use these recordings uh, on the podcast I'm gonna add a new segment Uh, so feel free guys to leave any comments there's a there's a comment section there but also the voice comments that's the one that I'm really looking forward to Um, so please guys don't be shy head over there um, leave my voice leave me a voice comment and uh, uh, there's a very good chance uh, that I'll get played back on a, on a future episode um, guys this is episode number 20 very proud uh, that I've made it to number 20 guys uh, I've been very inconsistent for the last 10 years with everything that I've done I haven't been able to hold a job uh, haven't been able to stay clean for any length of time um, and these days I'm doing fairly well actually the best I've done um, maybe ever uh, and I'm just very thankful uh, that I'm having getting this chance to connect with so many great people and uh, I really um, really truly appreciate it. I just can't say it enough uh, there's there is a lot going on guys uh, I'm fairly busy I uh, really wouldn't have it any other way I don't have any time to think about all the bullshit that I used to be doing um, really excited I talk about it every podcast and I'll continue to talk about it every podcast I'm sitting uh, in the Matthew Lashinsky Memorial Studio uh, Matthew Lashinsky uh, was a former OHL hockey player drafted in the second round by the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds uh, in the OHL priority selection draft uh, back in 2002. Uh, He played for them for a couple of seasons. He battled with mental health and addiction much like myself and so many others. 
um, and unfortunately he lost his battle in 2017 uh, in December. I never had the pleasure to meet Matthew Lashinsky, but through this outlet I've been able to connect with so many people, so many great people, including his family members now, his mother Nancy, his dad Peter, his sister Amy, uh, and the reason why I was able to connect with them was because of a guy named Matt Thompson. Uh, Matt Thompson was friends with Matthew Lashinsky um, through the good times and the bad. Um, and I know he's missing him like crazy, and uh, he was the one that shared the story about Lashinsky, uh, about how he passed away and his struggles uh, with me, and uh, Thompson and I have become extremely close, uh, though we haven't met in person yet. Uh, we talk multiple times a day. Um, he's been really supportive, uh, and him and I have decided uh, to recreate this studio uh, in Matthew Lashinsky's honor. Um, what a privilege it is for both of us. I know we're both extremely proud uh, to be doing this. Uh, he's actually sent me the material list. Uh, I'm going to be ordering the wood uh, maybe tomorrow or the next day, and he is coming up uh, this Sunday. I believe it's May the 30th, 2020, uh, for a couple of days uh, to frame in this new studio, to put a roof on it, um, and do as much as we possibly can. And of course, uh, we get to hang out for the first time. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we've had uh, a few great donations. Um, the re most recent one from Mark Gagnon. Um, I want to say thank you to him. Uh, Matthew and I are very uh, proud to be building this studio and putting our own money into it. I know Taylor uh, is very supportive of it, her family, uh, and a lot of other people too, like Sean Horswell, like I said on the last podcast, dropped off the flooring, which was just fantastic. So thank you again. Uh, he also uh, ordered me the Roadcaster Pro, which is going to change uh, the dynamics of my podcast. It is a podcasting interface that is just incredible. Uh, I'm going to talk about it more on a later podcast. I should have it in a week's time. I'm really excited about getting that. Uh, it's been a nightmare trying to send Sean the money for it, um, but uh, he's gone to great lengths to track one down because they're on back order everywhere across the world. Uh, and uh, to put a deposit down. So Sean, thank you so much for all that you've done, buddy. Uh, I really appreciate your friendship. Uh, you know, through hearing about uh, Matthew Lashinsky, he was just uh, one of so many that have battled with addiction and mental health uh, and just one of so many hockey players. Uh, of course, Derek Bugard uh, lost his battle. Uh, Wade Belak, Rick Rippin, um, taught you and just to name a few. Um, and there's been a lot of others uh, that have skated uh, through it by the skin of their teeth um, but there's a lot of hockey players still struggling out there uh, Jesse Paradise, owner of Team Issued Limited uh, myself, Michael Hengen, WHL alumni, my best friend uh, my dad Brian uh, and Theron Fleury, as well as many others, including Aaron Miller, who's going to be on the podcast, uh, who's her brother also uh, passed away from addiction, who is a hockey player, and she has the Miller Strong Foundation, uh, really advocating for change uh, with the opioid crisis uh, with athletes and a lot of great things. So I'm bringing her on board uh, because, of course, we need a female's touch. Taylor's on board. Uh, Jesse's girlfriend, Melissa, she's provided us with uh, the logos, so I want to say thank you to her. A um, couple different variations, it's just been great. We're working on the website, we're working on incorporating it, we're holding a Zoom meeting, hopefully in a week, I want to say, but uh, it may be postponed a little bit because we're just trying to get a little bit more organized. Uh, at that first Zoom meeting, guys, we're going to uh, swear in uh, the new bylaws for the foundation. Um, we're going to vote on the president, uh, the vice president, the treasurer, all those things. Um, I've been doing my homework and reading uh, what it takes to be a charity and what we need to do. Uh, and that uh, leads me to my next thing. And uh, it's been suggested to me to find a lawyer. Uh, so I've been active, actively searching for a lawyer. And uh, so I did a Google search and um, Google hockey lawyers and uh, found a couple and sent an email. But then I came across a page, uh, Ken Dryden, and I remember hearing on so many documentaries that uh, he actually took time um, out of uh, one of his NHL seasons to finish his law degree. And uh, so I tracked down his email because I saw that he's the president of the University of Ottawa. Um, so I went on their website, found his email, his little bio there, and uh, I sent an email off to him. 
um, explaining uh, the situation uh, with the Puck Support Foundation. Um, wrote him an email uh, just uh, asking if he'd be interested in helping us out. And uh, I got a response the very next day from the university saying um, he's more of a, a figure in the university. He doesn't uh, typically use this mailbox, but they were going to forward the email to him. And actually later on in the evening, I was speaking to Ken Campbell, who of course is uh, a very well-known uh, hockey writer, one of the best around, uh, works for the Hockey News. I've been talking to him because he's actually wrote an article on me, which is fantastic. It comes out June 1st. Uh, make sure you guys go. It'll be a digital issue, I believe. It can be purchased on thehockeynews.com. I will post a link on June 1st. Um, but I spoke to him, and I said, hey, do you have Ken Dryden's contact? And he said, why? And I explained to him, and I forwarded him the email, uh, and he agreed to uh, send it to Ken Dryden, to me. Uh, not just for me, uh, for us, for the foundation. Um, and... Uh, what a cool, uh, I, you know, immediately texted uh, Jesse Paradise uh, and Mike Hengen and uh, we're just all so excited. Who knows if he's going to respond, um, but just the fact that Ken Campbell was willing to uh, fire off that email, I really, truly appreciate it. Uh, the article was uh, extremely well written. He sent me a copy of it. Uh, I, it's just, I can't say enough about it. Uh, it's just really great. Um, as far as the puck support goes, guys, hockeyheroin.com for now. Um, click if you're on your cell phone at the home page there's a little uh, three lines at the top there uh, click on that find the puck support page uh, go on there guys there's a contact form there fill it out if you want to help create this great great cause um, that we're very proud of uh, we need all the help we can get we're certainly not uh, experienced in this but we have contacted professionals including medical professionals that are hopefully going to come on board uh, we're really doing this thing the right way guys and, and Jesse's going to be in charge of all the financials he's actually about to be a registered chartered uh, accountant through the University of Manitoba so uh, you know and he owns his own business and he's just a financial guy so um, you know it's all just coming together and I'm just su super proud of, uh, of all of our efforts and I'm really excited to get it off the ground uh, other than that guys once again hockey to heroin the road to recovery is proudly brought to you by team issued limited team issued is connecting all walks of life team issued does this by recreating that special feeling of being part of something bigger a community of all striving striving towards the same goal I don't know why I'm still having trouble spitting that one out, but I am. Uh, guys, head over to teamissued.ca. Use promo code TOEDRAG15 to get 15% off your total purchase. Guys, their clothing and hats and everything is phenomenal. Uh, I've put already put in two orders, received them, and I've put in the third one, getting it next week. I'm decked out, team issued, head to toe. So is Taylor, so are the kids. Uh, I love it. Their hats are super comfortable, high quality. Their sweatsuits are unbelievable. Their new active shorts, guys. If you're into working out, these active shorts are incredible uh, and extremely affordable. Uh, and once again, too, uh, we are going to be doing giveaways, team issued giveaways every single week. Taylor and I, compliments of teamissued.ca, um, every Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern. Though it will be subject to change because we have two little ones and another one on the way. Um, I will definitely be posting it if that's the case. But uh, we will be, you know, join us on Facebook uh, every Sunday, 9 p.m. If you've entered uh, on hockeydayheroin.com, the main page, uh, fill out the form every week. We're going to be doing draws, uh, a weekly draw, a monthly draw that's a little bit bigger, and possibly even a yearly draw that's even bigger. So uh, please, guys, head over to hockeydayheroin.com. Uh, fill out the contact form for the team issued giveaways if you want to win some team issued swag Sunday nights live stream Taylor and I uh, that's more Taylor's thing she'll be in charge of that uh, but you don't want to miss out on that because their uh, their clothing is just phenomenal congratulations to last week's winners Dan Sullivan who won the, the burgundy team issued snapback hat and Justin Bryan who won the ladies team issued tank top for his wife uh, those were mailed off uh, four or five days ago with tracking numbers and the whole nines uh, and uh, really excited for those guys to get these products because team issued is uh, is just so incredible guys uh, other than that 
let's get right into this episode. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you guys just how excited I am to have this guy on the podcast. I mean, I'm going to tell a quick story right now. Growing up in Port Coquitlam, uh, BC, uh, I remember my dad bought a computer for uh, our family, my sister and I, uh, when I was about eight or nine years old. Uh, and basically from that moment on, uh, that computer was on this desk that my dad bought at the same time, and in the desk drawer, it was more like a junk drawer. And for whatever reason, there was a series of hockey cards that never left that drawer. There was about 10 or 12 hockey cards in that drawer for years and years, even when we moved. Um, you know, that desk came, the drawer never got emptied, uh, and uh, it was there. And in that drawer, in those hockey cards, was a Kimby Daniels top prospect Philadelphia Flyers hockey card. Uh, and I remember reading it as a kid uh, that he had played for the Swift Current Broncos, because um, I remember when all this stuff came out about, uh, you know, the unfortunate events of Sheldon Kennedy. Uh, Swift Current was just in my mind, um, just, you know, because some of the stuff was similar that happened to me like I talked about on the other podcast um, but anyways so this hockey card was always there uh, and then obviously I went on to play for the Swift Current Broncos and when I arrived in the dressing room I spoke about it on other podcasts uh, they used to have records on the walls and um, this guy's name was all over those records too this guy had a 64 goal 64 assist season with the Swift Current Broncos He also holds the WHL record for most goals in a game with seven. Are you kidding me? Seven goals in one game in a 7-4 win. Uh, Unbelievable. Um, He was drafted uh, in the third round uh, by the Philadelphia Flyers in the 1990 NHL entry draft, 44th overall was also drafted in the 2004 LNAH draft by the Sorrel Tracy Mission uh, team, which is uh, a league out in Quebec, better known for the documentary The Chiefs, uh, more of a fighter league. Uh, Kimby never played there, but he was drafted by them. Um, Kimby did make it to the NHL. He played 27 games, recording three points, Um, but unfortunately uh, suffered from a degenerative injury and uh, really hindered his uh, lightning skating ability uh, that was uh, really uh, showcased at the 1989 Memorial Cup that the Swift Current Broncos won that he was a part of he had five goals one assist in that tournament uh, he was only 16 years old after putting up 30 goals as a rookie all even strength uh, he was the talk of the tournament uh, just an incredible young talent uh, Never had quite the NHL career that he had once hoped for, um, but nonetheless had a very, very successful uh, professional hockey career playing uh, over 900 professional uh, hockey league games, uh, recording 870 points. He's 29th all time on the ECHL scoring list, 22nd all time on the assist list, and 43rd all time in games played. Um, he played 500 games for the Alaska Aces, 169 goals, 335 assists for 504 points over a point a game. Uh, just incredible. Uh, I actually got to play my first professional game against this guy uh, playing for the Victoria Salmon Kings. Uh, it all came full circle right from the hockey card as a kid to playing for the Swift Current Broncos to getting to play against them in my very first professional game uh, and my second professional game, which I scored in the game-winning goal to capture the West Division ECHL Championship from underneath the Alaska Aces that this guy played for. Um, What a privilege to have this guy on the podcast, even though I gave him a hard time uh, when I played against him because there were stories about that he was a partier, um, that maybe he suffered some of the abuse from Graham James when he played in Swift Current, but there is such an excellent article that I read uh, that was done a few years ago uh, called The Greatest That Never Was uh, that explains uh, what happened, uh, why Kimby didn't have the NHL career that everybody thought he was going to once. Uh, It wasn't due to the partying. Um, It wasn't due to the abuse that was never 
uh, rendered against him, uh, it was due more to the knee injury um, and just the difficulties that come with trying to uh, make it and stay in the NHL. It's such a common theme, such a hard, hard life. Uh, but this guy maybe did it better than anybody else in the minors. So without further ado, from Anchorage, Alaska, Kimby Daniels, thank you so much for taking the time and being a part of the Hockey to Heroin, the Road to Recovery family. Uh, Kimby, once again, thanks for doing this, man. Thanks. Glad to join you. Uh, Kimby, man, what a what a chance is for us to connect. Uh, you know, I never actually got to spoke to you, speak to you, other than uh, we had a little brief, uh, you know, interaction on the ice. So I mentioned this story uh, in the intro about the hockey cards. Really cool. You had a nasty mullet in that picture. I'll tell you too. But I think everybody did back then. Um, but you know, that's a, you know, so when I saw you on Facebook the other day, Kimby, uh, last week or whatever, and I was like thinking about, it, I'm like, wow, that's so cool. And I started thinking about that. Uh, and then I was thinking, you know, that was, uh, when I t- turned professional, um, in 2008, after we lost out to the Seattle Thunderbirds, uh, with, I was playing with the Kelowna Rockets. Uh, I was supposed to go to the Norfolk with the American Hockey League. Um, but they weren't making the playoffs and then I had a couple games. I couldn't get the work visa. So I went to the only Canadian team in the East Coast Hockey League, which was the Victoria Salmon Kings. Um, and they were in uh, a, a whatever a title race, a uh, West Division banner race with the Alaska Aces. Um, and the final three games of the season uh, were in Victoria. And I got called up and I played in, uh, I think, the final two of them. Uh, and you were on the other team. And that was kind of cool. So my first pro game, uh, I got to play against you and you were near the end of your career, Kimby. But I remember sitting on the bench and going, wow, you know, like I remember being like fuck six, five, six, seven years old and looking at your hockey card. And now here I am on the ice with you. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, I just, you know, wanted to tell you that. But uh, Kimby, what a career you had. I want to talk to you a little bit about your time in Swift Current because, you know, I played there. uh, I've had a lot of Swift Current Broncos uh, on the program. Um, It's a very uh, storied franchise for a lot of uh, good reasons, and it had a lot of negative attention. Sheldon Kennedy was on my podcast. Uh, You know, we spoke a little bit about that, and I know you were around that. uh, And you actually had to deal with a lot of that stuff uh, in different ways, and I wanted to talk to you about that because – a lot of people put pressure on you at different times uh, about that situation. And you were always adamant that uh, you weren't part of it and that you were really shocked. And I don't like to bring this stuff up because it's a really hard situation. Uh, but how was your time in Swift Current, Kim? Because I was watching the interview of you at 16 years old today. Um, and you didn't look 16. Holy shit. You look like you're 25 for one. <laughs> um, but, you know, you guys had such a good team. Uh, what do you remember from that experience uh, as a 16-year-old in the Memorial Cup? Well, it was um, it was a, obviously a great experience. When I when I joined Swift Current, I had no idea that um, that they were and then we were going to be as good as we were. Um, you know, they had some great players. Obviously, I spent the first part of the season. I probably, I mean, may have played you know three or four shifts a game. Probably the first 25, 30 games, and then we had some injuries, and that opened things up for me. So, I ended up the last 30, 30 odd games playing pretty much, uh, you know, on the third line, killing penalties. Um, I don't think I ever played the power play till the playoffs, but that just showed how how good and deep we were. But we had a we had a great team, great great teammates, great players. Uh, I think we had six or seven that uh, went through the bus crash. So those those were probably some of the best teammates I've ever had. But uh, that season was certainly uh, certainly a special one, one that uh, one that I'll never forget. And uh, a lot of the guys that that we played uh, that played on that team, we had a reunion. It's already been ten or eleven years now. So, um, but you just never really seem to miss a beat with them. Whether you go five years, two years, ten years talking to them, everything kind of just feels like it was uh, it was yesterday. No, for sure. And you mentioned, uh, I was reading too, and you had such a great year as a 16 year old and you had a phenomenal playoff run, um, an excellent Memorial cup. You were one of the most talked about, uh, players. I know Mike Ricci was, uh, probably the most talked about player going into that tournament as a 16 year old. But, uh, I think you took over from that. And I mean, I watched a few of the highlights and you were just a phenomenal player. 
and we'll get to that. But you scored 30 goals as a 16 year old and they were all even strength, like not <laughs> one on the power play. And you're saying you're playing on the third line. I don't think that happens ever again. Like, you know what I mean? For someone to score 30 goals in major junior and not have one on the power play is, is pretty wild uh, to score 30 goals is, is an accomplishment, but to have none on the power play is, is just crazy. Not even one. Um, what a, what a great year you guys had. Um, so many, so many good, good players were on that team. And, um, I know Lauren Fry was your guys' assistant coach. Uh, he just retired. Actually, I just talked to him. He's coming on the program too. Uh, probably next week. I'm looking forward to him. He's, he's just such a great guy. Um, yeah, I know you spent, yeah, you spent three years in Swift Current, uh, and then you moved on, um, to, to Philadelphia, but then you actually came back to the Western league with Seattle and tri cities. Um, but what was your experience like moving from the WHL to the NHL as an 18 year old? Well, it was, um, my first, well, I went to my first training camp after my draft year and, um, I, I almost made the team. They offered me a contract and uh, my agent at the time said it was uh, said it was an okay contract, but he said, if they're going to send you back to junior, don't sign it, go back, play a year junior and, and you'll get a better contract in the summer. So I ended up not signing the contract, um, played three or four exhibition games that first camp and then went back to junior. Um, when our season ended, we got knocked out three straight, surprisingly, that year in Swift Current. Um, I think Moose Jaw beat us. So the Flyers said that they were going to call me up and have me play in Hershey in the American League. I, I hadn't signed a contract yet. So I, um, I flew into Philly. They had somebody pick me up at the airport and took me to the, the training camp hotel that, that I'd stayed in and said that um, – there's a practice in the morning and they want you to go to it. So I, you know, I was like, all right, that sounds good, good to me. So I ended up uh, going to a morning skate that day. Um, you referenced the mullet. That was probably in full force um, that day when I got there. I went and took part in the morning skate, hadn't signed a contract. Um, they had a game that night against Washington, which they had to win to get into the playoffs. Uh, so long story short, I ended up signing a contract during that day. Um, and it was the same contract that they offered me in the fall, but it was a tryout. So when that season ended, uh, there was two games, regular season games left. And then if we made the playoffs, the playoffs, they would have to re-sign me in the summer. So basically it worked out to be in a two game contract. Um, but I ended up signing it so I could play that night. Uh, but it was, uh, it was a long day, uh, after after the morning skate, um, everybody now knows who Craig Berube is. He was on the team, and uh, after after the skate, we're getting dressed, had a shower, getting dressed, and jokingly he said, "Hey, nobody on this team has longer hair than me." So, so after uh, after the morning skate, I took a taxi to the mall, had lunch, got a haircut, um, and it's one of my hockey cards actually just. <laughs> just a fresh buzz cut. So I came back to the rink and he was, he saw my hair. He's like, man, I was just kidding. You didn't have to go get a haircut. And I was like, no, no, I needed one. Don't worry about it. So, <laughs> um, so it was, uh, yeah, a few hours before the game, my hair was a lot longer. Um, and then also in the warm up, I took warm up. I had a blue Titan stick. I had blue blades from playing for swift current. And, uh, so they had to spray paint the stick. They had to spray paint the blades and, something to do with the contract with Titan, not paying whatever it was. So, um, yeah, I just ended up at the spur of the moment, uh, signing the contract probably around five 30. Um, I think right before warm up, and, uh, and then playing my first game. So it was, uh, it was something, it was a, definitely a long day, stressful day, but, uh, it, you know, it worked out in the end to, to eventually play, uh, play an NHL game, which is obviously everybody's dream. So it was, uh, it was pretty good, pretty oh, good yeah. experience. Yeah, that is ultimately, uh, if you're playing hockey, the goal to, to play in the NHL and uh, to even play a single game is an accomplishment. To stay there is, is a lot harder thing. And um, there was a lot of questions surrounding uh, what happened uh, with your career. And, you know, I had uh, Chris Beach uh, on not too long ago. He was drafted seventh overall, um, but, you know, played in the NHL. But again, his c career never quite panned out the way that uh, he had anticipated just because so many things happened. Um, there's a great article 
um, that was written. And uh, I'm not exactly sure when it, I have it written down, but when it was written, but I'm going to post a link to it. And it's, you know, the one I'm talking about, just, I think the title is one of the greatest that never was. And I don't like to say that something along those lines. Um, but what an in-depth look into your life, because, uh, I said in the beginning that I chirped you and like anybody that played with me or against me, I was just the biggest mouthpiece idiot on the ice just cause that's just the way I was or whatever, but I was just having fun. But I remember specifically, it's funny that you just said you had to spray paint the sick cause you had a blue Well, you were the only f- guy with a blue visor playing the last case <laughs> you got the blue tinted visor. And I remember specifically Kimby, I said something along the lines of, because I remember people saying this, saying like, oh, Kimby's an alcoholic, Kimby's a drug addict. And I, so I remember, and like at this time, I mean, I mean, I was doing the drugs partying a little bit. I remember th- saying something to you like, hey, Kimby, where are we going? Where are we partying tonight? Like just joking, like, what do you got the tinted visor? Because what do you hide? Does the, the lights bothering you or what? Like that's what I was saying to you. And like, because that's just what I had heard. And like, I'll, t- I'll be honest with you, Kimby. Um, at the time, I remember sitting there and people saying that. And I was like, wow, like. I was like almost sad to see that because like I had thought at the time that all those things were true about you. So when I actually had the chance to read this article not that long ago, and that's when I reached out to you, I was like, wow, this is incredible. So I'll let you tell the story. But uh, a lot of these things that people thought uh, were true were certainly not. Uh, You suffered from a degenerative knee injury uh, and that really hindered your skating ability. Uh, You were uh, a lights out skater. Um, by all reports, uh, Scott Bonner, uh, one of the most respected general managers in the Western Hockey League uh, for a time, uh, has been on record saying, you know, you were just one of the most phenomenal skaters. And to have that ability taken away must have been extremely hard. Uh, I don't know how you're feeling about that now, but uh, if you mind talking about that, but you want to share that story uh, about what happened, because that happened fairly early on in your career, Kimby. Yeah, it did. It was my uh, it was my third um, third training camp. My would have been my second season in Philly um, when I had um, had a bone graft surgery done. But uh, they just said that that there was a hole uh, in my knee that kept getting bigger in the, in the two previous years, um, and they had never done the surgery before. So it was kind of just a thing where should I just keep playing and maybe play for three or four more years and then not play or try to get a surgery and, and maybe play after that. So it was, it, it was a big decision. I said, I thought about it for a little while and I thought, well, if, if the doctor's confident in, in doing this kind of surgery, then, um, you know, maybe I'll try that and maybe I'll be able to play. And so, uh, it, it kind of changed the configuration of, of as weird as it sounds of my knee down. It, uh, it's kind of warped my shin, uh, my foot kind of goes in and, it's, but I could still skate, but obviously not quite like I did prior to that. So, uh, that part was, was different, but, uh, as for pain and stuff like that, it, it didn't really bother me until, uh, until my last year I played in, um, in Phoenix. So I definitely was able to recover and, and play a long time with it. But, um, you know, I certainly didn't have the, um, the speed, the quickness that I had prior to it. And, that kind of changed the way I played a little bit. Um, you know, obviously I went from being a top prospect to not being a top prospect and kind of having to prove myself all over again. So no matter where I went, I just played a a defensive safe game, just trying to get back on the ice because back then in the nineties, it was the dead puck era. I mean, if you didn't, if you couldn't check, you weren't going to be put on the ice as dumb as that sounds now, the way the game's played, but that was just how coaches operated. And so, I just kind of changed the way I played, became more of a defensive player and, um, you know, basically had a show that I could be put on the ice. And when you're on tryouts and you don't have contracts, that's, that's a tough way to go. But, uh, but yeah, just, you know, from a, from a standpoint of how it changed my career, it definitely made a big change, but I also think back and I, you know, I think, you know, I, maybe I could have been better, you know, even after that, and maybe I could have played better, done what done more and, and made it back on my own merit. So I don't, I don't blame anybody or anything. I just, I mean, I think I had a, a nice long career. I've enjoyed it immensely. So I uh, definitely have no complaints about it. Oh, well, no, you, you played for, for so long. I mean, you almost have a thousand uh, career pro games. Uh, you're well over a thousand with uh, playoffs and uh, you know, and your numbers, uh, you're very close to a point a game. 
Um, and that's including your NHL numbers. Uh, you played 27 games in NHL. I believe you had three points. And um, actually, uh, if I if I remember correctly, you actually had two points in like your first three games or something, or two points in your first couple games. Um, and then, you know, I was thinking about it, Kimby, and like like you just talked about. And yeah, you got injured and and you came back and there was no pain. Uh, but I was looking at your stats, and I have them here uh, because I was, you know, look, reading about that and saw that you hurt your knee um, and that you didn't have a chance to really play that much. And you didn't, uh, you didn't, you didn't play a whole lot of, like, you didn't play a lot of games in those years to follow the the knee injury. And I was really thinking what that's like uh, for a player, especially as a prospect, because uh, as we both know as hockey players. Uh, that new crop is coming every single year. Um, so, you know, it, I, it would have been so hard. Uh, you know, it, it is so hard, uh, you know, especially once uh, you're out to, to make it back. And uh, I know you went over to, to Europe. You played over in Slovenia. Uh, why didn't you stay over in Europe? Like, that kind of surprises me that you didn't uh, play over in Europe for 20 years. Yeah, I, I went over, I played in Slovenia, and that was just phenomenal. I didn't even know what Slovenia was. Um, Neil Sheehy, the old flame who was just getting into the agent business, is the one that uh, put me onto it. But uh, I went over there, had a blast. Um, the first time I went over, uh, the reason I didn't stay was I, I still thought at, at that age that I'd have a chance to, to play in the NHL at some point. Um, so that's why I didn't stay long term. But um Certainly, when I look back on all of my stops, Slovenia is, is right near the top. It was just an incredible hockey town. Uh, fans were great. Uh, everything about it was just just phenomenal. We ended up winning um, the championship the first time I was there, which they hadn't done in 10 or 15 years. So, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great experience. But uh, I, I, for me, it just it, – I thought – I'd be able to come back, play in the American League or International League, get back to the National Hockey League. I didn't want to just go to Europe at that point and uh, and give up on that. So that was probably the big reason that uh, that I never stayed over stayed over in Europe. It, it's such a common uh, common theme. Uh, I hear it from so many guys. Um, it's a lot easier for guys that never have that taste of the NHL. Um, but I think once you have that that taste of the NHL. And if you, you know uh, that you could play there uh, and especially, you know, all of a sudden you start seeing guys that you were outscoring in junior or whatever, and they're finding success just for whatever the reasons you start fitting with different teams. Um, but yeah, once you have that taste, uh, the NHL, uh, you know, I can only imagine that it's, you're, you're trying to claw your way back, but you, you really did have a, a long, long successful hockey career uh you spent the majority of it up in alaska where you are now and um actually i was fortunate uh to play up in alaska against the aces on a number of occasions with the salmon kings and uh, i actually tell people all the time to this day that alaska is my favorite place in the entire world that i've been to um because uh, it's just so beautiful when oh, I remember getting off the plane at the airport and like the air up there, there's just something about the air. Like it just has a, this different quality. Um, the seafood was phenomenal. I don't know where we went to the seafood restaurant, uh, but it was so good. Um, and there's no tax like that place. Is just <laughs> That place was awesome. I really enjoyed uh, going up there. I know the aces aren't there anymore. Um, what's going on around there, uh, when COVID-19 isn't going on, what's the, what's the big ticket in Alaska? Well, it, it, with, yeah, with the aces being gone, it's, it's tough now. I mean, there's, there's not a lot going on in the winter. They still have the, uh, college team, but that they've struggled for, for geez, almost 20 years now. So, um, I don't know that they'll be around much longer. Um, but I mean, you, you got snow machining, skiing, there's a beautiful ski resort just south of Anchorage, 20. 25 minutes away um and then in the summertime that's that's definitely the big thing up here i mean you're looking at almost 24 7 daylight 
uh, fishing is is a huge huge thing up here camping and i i'm not even an outdoors guy i mean i just i mean i i just love living up here because it's a lot like canada um like you mentioned no tax not too congested you can kind of be go places and be left alone so th that's what i like the most about alaska but uh yeah if you're definitely something but somebody that's into the outdoors this is the place to be but uh you know, I've, I've been here 20 years now and I, I don't think that I'm that I'm going to go anywhere else. So the, the winters are sometimes get a little long, but uh, but uh, the summers certainly make up for it because you're getting that that sun that uh, seems to never set for for at least two or three months. So that's definitely a nice, uh, nice thing about it. Oh, for sure. Uh, no, Alaska is, is definitely beautiful. I would love to get up there again one day. Uh, do you get on the ice at all anymore? Are you involved in hockey at all? I know you have a couple kids. Uh, are they involved in hockey at all? I have a, a boy and a girl. My son plays. Um, he's played. He's seven, <clears throat> excuse me, 17 now. I coached him when he was younger for a little bit, but, uh, haven't, haven't, uh, haven't coached hockey in a long, long time. Um, I do play. I do play in a men's league. Um, I've been on the, on this team for ten years. Uh, it's a thirty-five and older league, so um, it is the closest thing to professional hockey in the sense that we've kind of had the same team for since I've been playing. And and I'm telling you, these guys, some of them really like to get after it, and it, it's it's. Well, uh, when I first started playing, I was thinking to myself, don't you guys got to go to work tomorrow? Like, like, don't you got to get up early? Because, I mean, we'd be out till four, three, four in the morning sometimes on a Tuesday after a game. Yeah. And and, uh, and we've just kind of kept playing together. Great group of guys. So that part of it definitely made it easier for me and my adjustment from not playing professional hockey. Um, you know, we've been, you know, it's been 10 years now for me to play, play on that same team with that same group of guys. So it's, uh, it's kind of at least replaced part of what you miss when you retire, you know, finding a team, being part of a team. So that's definitely been, uh, been a big help. I've had a, I've had a blast doing it. So it's, uh, um, you know, I, I think from that standpoint, definitely I consider myself lucky to be, uh, to be part of that group. Yeah, well, it's it's really you are lucky when you can find something like that. I was uh, lucky enough to play on a team like that. Uh, they were together for a long time. They actually were a junior B team that won the national championship, and these guys uh, played on the same beer league team. I mean, they're, the the core group. There's like ten of them that were on the junior B team together uh, that won the national championship or whatever. And I mean, they were ten years older than I was. Uh, and they brought me and my buddy on board when I was like 23, 24. I, we won the championship and all that. And it was lots of fun. And um, But I ended up getting suspended, I think, for life from the league uh, for attacking somebody in the dressing room uh, after the game. But we'll leave that for another day. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was just actually, you know what, the guy the guy did something to uh to one of my friends so I slash my buddy in the face or something i can't remember but yeah. I, I went a little bit uh looney tunes on this guy um what's <laughs> the what's the best memory you have? i know it must be hard but is there one memory that really sticks out for you in your career that was just either um a lot more profound than the others or uh, you know, one that you just were able to enjoy more than the other side. I know you won a Kelly Cup uh, with the Aces. You won the championship in Slovenia. Um, you know, you got to play in the NHL. You would play the World Juniors. You won a Memorial Cup. There's so many things, can be, uh, But is there one that stands out uh, more than the others? It, it, I think it would probably be the uh, the Kelly Cup that we won in Alaska. And, and only because when I first came up here, um, the team wasn't doing very well. Uh, and then I, I believe after my second year, the, um, the owner ended up putting the team for sale on eBay and <laughs> they went into bankruptcy and, and, and you kind of get that reputation for, you know, it was like two or three years that I was here where we were a losing team and you're kind of branded as, you know, part of that losing culture and you're the reason why. So, um, when we, when they did get new owners and we were able to turn it around, I was you know, more probably is more involved in, in those teams that won that I was in the previous three that, uh, that didn't win. So I think when we won that first one and that year, I probably played, I, I would guess, I, I mean, I had a, I had an old coach who came and watched one of the final games in Gwinnett. And he said, I mean, 
if I knew you could play that much, I would have played you that much when you were 23. And now I was in my <laughs> mid thirties playing probably 25 to 27 minutes a game as a forward and which is a lot, a lot of ice. So, oh, yeah. um, so I, it was probably that, that one we won in, uh, in Alaska. And, and, you know, as you mentioned, this is a huge hockey town and it was, it, it's basically like playing in a miniature NHL setting. We flew everywhere. We stayed in nice hotels. Uh, we got treated first class everybody in town knows who you are. I mean, it's, it, it was just a fantastic place to play. And so that year that we went, went on that run and won the Kelly cup would probably be the one that, uh, that stands out the most for me. Yeah. I never got to win anything except for that beer league championship that I told you about. So <laughs> I can imagine that it was lots of fun. Uh, you played your last year of professional hockey, uh, down in Phoenix. You actually played with a couple of my really good buddies, uh, Mike Wilson and Dave Brotherford. What can you tell me about these two, uh, these two characters? Well, Wilson, I, it's funny. I forgot all about Mike Wilson. He was, he was funny, quiet kid. He was a good little, good defenseman. Um, didn't really say much, but you could tell he had a pretty good sense of humor. Um, and then Rutherford came in, I think near the end of the year. And I can't remember where, where we got him from, but he was a piece of work. He, you know, just one of those guys that's always in a good mood, always, always yapping, um, you get him on the game, he's yapping at the other team, he's yapping at his own players, but uh, he was a good player. I love the way he played. He was effective, gritty, had some skill, um, but definitely uh, definitely a funny guy. So, um, yeah, they were they were both we, – we had a really young team. It had been a while since I had played on a team that young, um, and, and uh, you know, I was obviously by far the oldest player, but we had a lot of first, second-year pros on that team, so – um, I, I enjoyed it immensely. It was uh, that was one of my best uh, best memories in hockey was playing that last year in Phoenix. Yeah, you actually, I, I forgot that uh, James McEwen was on that team too. He was the captain in Kelowna. So, but I, Mike Wilson's actually like one of my best friends. He and so is like brother Dave Rutherford was like one of my best friends from the time I was uh, fifteen till twenty one or whatever. Like literally, I call his mom mom and. Uh, Wilson lived right next door to me in Swift Current. We played together on the Broncos, right? So, uh, and, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we had lots of fun. But uh, yeah, you might, you were the oldest guy on the team, but you led the, you led them in scoring. You led the team in scoring <laughs> last year, uh, and then you shut her down. How old were you your last year? Uh, I think it was thirty six. And um, yeah, the only reason I stopped playing, I loved I loved playing and living in Phoenix, but the team ended up folding. So um, I think had they stuck around at least another year i probably would have played another year or maybe even two because uh i was living in alaska but obviously the ideal scenario is if you could spend your winters in arizona and your summers in alaska then that's the way to do it so um unfortunately the team uh, the owner had a little bit of cash flow problems so he ended up shutting down the the phoenix team but uh, other than that i would have probably kept playing i mean i i at that point in my career i just the game wasn't getting any harder i mean it it just but you know for me there was no i wasn't going anywhere i mean i knew that but i mean it was still fun it was a fun way to make a living a great city to play in my kids loved living there so um had they stuck around i definitely would have kept playing but uh you know unfortunately they didn't so then i thought well i don't really I don't really want to move anywhere else or go anywhere else outside of Alaska. So that kind of made the decision easy to, to stop playing at that point. Was there a, was there a transition period? I know, uh, you know, you you seem to be doing really well and you're, you know, uh, it's been quite some time since you retired. I know you went and played some senior, you went and, you went and played some senior after uh, you, you mentioned you're playing uh, with your men's team. Um, but was there a transition period, uh, any sort of, did you go through any sort of, uh, maybe not depression is the right word, but um, did you feel lost at all? Or were, were you just kind of like, okay, you know what? I had a good career. I got my kids. I'm going to focus on this now um, because it's not that easy for everybody. Was how, how was it for you? No, it was even up until my last, my, my time in, um, in Phoenix, like I, I always felt like I was going to stay in the game that I was going to get a job in hockey. And I thought, you know, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. But it, probably the last couple of years, I realized how hard it was for me to find a job year to year as a player, a lot harder than it should have been. And, you know, then I thought, you know what, when I'm done playing, 
I'm, I'm probably going to be in the same scenario. Like who's going to hire me? So, um, you know, it, it was probably tough for a couple of years. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't play or do anything in the winter. I went and played in, um, Fort St. John, uh, but I didn't start playing until, uh, February of, of that year. So I played my last year in Phoenix, um, and then didn't even skate until, well, I guess I could say it now. I, I, I didn't skate until I showed up and played my first game there. Um, I had told them I was skating, but, uh, but I, but I wasn't, um, and, and that was a great time in, in Fort St. John as well. So, um, I went and did that. I got a chance to win an Allen cup, which was a great experience. I, I loved, uh, I loved my time there. A great little city in, in Northern BC, excellent fans, excellent support. Um, but then the next year, you know, I realized I'd applied for some jobs in hockey, didn't get them. And I just realized like, it's probably not going to happen for me. So, um, you know, for a couple of years, it was tough because what I was doing work wise was more of a seasonal thing. It was kind of a spring through fall, um, schedule. And so in the winter, you know, I wasn't really playing anything. I took care of my kids, spent the day to day with them, but you kind of miss being part of a team, miss that void. So that part was, was tough for a couple of years, but then, you know, I was able to kind of look past not being involved in hockey and realizing that I just got to move forward with my life. And, and that's kind of what I've done. So certainly no complaints, uh, you know, anymore from that standpoint. I mean, obviously I'd love to be involved in hockey at a level, um, you know, as high as possible. I think I have a lot to offer, but I'm not, you know, going to try to start from the lowest rung at this stage of my life and work my way up. It just, that wouldn't make any sense. So, uh, but definitely, yeah, for a couple of years, it was a struggle, but, uh, you know, things, uh, things have gotten better. So I don't have any complaints now. Well, on this, on the staff side of things can be, I mean, you're still very young, right? So, uh, I wouldn't, uh, get too down and, and say that you didn't get any jobs and you play. I, I would keep trying. And I think you may be surprised, um, that you know you may get some opportunities down the road if that's really what you want to do um you have such an awesome resume you're such a great guy and um i i truly believe that you have a lot to offer too um there's not too many guys that have been able to do what you did uh for the amount of time that you did it just it really doesn't happen the only other guy that i can think close uh would be wes goldie but he never played in the in the nhl um, but he was the only other one that I knew that was able to put up consistent numbers uh, year in and year out, even into his 30s. Um, and, you know, you like I said, you even led your team in scoring your last year. Um, and I remember watching you play. Um, and I was listening to you talk earlier and uh, I was thinking about it as you were talking, um, how you had to readjust your game when you hurt your knee. Um, and I remember watching you play. And it, you look so effortless, like you weren't trying, I remember. Like, you know what I mean? But then, they, like, on the score sheet, you got, like, three or four points. It's like, and you were always in the right spot. And it was just like, I remember watching you being like, ah, this guy's been playing pro for the last 15 years. And I you, I could tell. You know what I mean? There was just such a, I, I don't know, I was just sort of, like, in awe. And I, I remember guys even in the dressing room talking. Like, I, I think I even got shit, actually, if I remember correctly for chirping you because like they're like ah oh, shut the fuck like guys in my own team were telling me to sh like shut up leave you alone <laughs> um because they had that much respect for you you know and that rarely happens so i think i just shut my mouth after that um but <laughs> uh well i i, I could tell you i brought a lot of it on myself because i would I, I mean i i've said the worst things you can say on the ice stuff obviously back when we played and even prior to you playing pro, I mean, you could say things, do things that you just can't do anymore. And, and, you know, but when I played, it was, I probably made the game a lot harder for myself than I needed to because of chirping and the way I played being dirty and cheap. And I probably should have just shut my mouth and try to play a cleaner game. And I probably could have, you know, got, got a little, got a little more, uh, a little more room, a little more time, but, uh, but it, for me, that was the only way to play. I mean, it, if I wasn't involved in the game that way, I felt like I wasn't involved in the game. So it, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've never, I've never taken anything personal on the ice of all the years I've played anything that's ever been said to me. I've never taken it personal. And, um, you know, obviously in this day and age, things are different. So, 
Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was for me to play effective. I always had to be involved, whether it was yelling, chirping other guys, taking penalties, whatever it may have been. That was just, uh, that was just how it worked for me. So I, uh, yeah, it was uh, the only way to go. Yeah, I was the same way. I was, uh, they did the best of the West, uh, which is, uh, I don't know if they had it when you played, but it's actually done with, uh, I believe it's the Tri-City Herald uh, out of the Tri-City, uh, obviously Tri-City Americans, uh, Kennewick, Washington newspaper. They do it. I don't know when it started, um, but it was around when I was playing in the Western League, and I know it's still around. It's called the Best of the West. And what they do is they send out uh, like a, like a, one of those manila envelopes uh, with all the sheets in it, and they send it to every team in the Western Conference, and there's like whatever, eight sheets in there. And then you break off into groups in your team. So like four guys, four guys, four guys, four guys, like per sheet, right? And on the sheet, yep. it's like, most improved, best fighters, toughest, most hated, most annoying, whatever, like all the things. And the players vote on it in the little groups of their team and then send it away. And then they, they uh, publish it in the newspaper. And my 20-year-old year, I think I got like second most hated in the Western Conference, first most annoying, and like, <laughs> I don't know, something like, I, I can't remember. But, you know, it's always very much the same. And uh, I always felt the same that if I wasn't, uh, involved in that way that I wasn't being affected. But so many times my coaches were being like, oh, calm down. You need to focus more on hockey. But I just couldn't. I just I yeah. felt like, yeah, I just I feel the same way. And, and uh, I feel like maybe by the time I met you uh, on the ice that uh, you had calmed down a little bit. I think uh, if you were 21 and I was 21, it might have been a little bit different story. Did you fight a lot uh, when you were younger? Not, not usually about maybe four or five times a year, but not, not a ton. It just kind of, it, it was just out of, I wouldn't even say necessity. It was just, I would get so worked up to the point and that's when it would happen. Um, and it was funny because when I put, when I was playing, when I was playing junior in swift current, our, our coach did say, Hey, you like, you should fight more often. Like you should, if you fought another f three or four more times a year, you're people are going to go near you. And um, you know, obviously I didn't take that advice, but, uh, it was just, uh, yeah, it was weird that, uh, a few times over the years, people would say you should fight more, but, uh, but no, I just kind of, I always felt, uh, you know, if, if you had a fight, it was just more out of kind of a spur of the moment thing, nothing that would be premeditated. And, um, you know, in the era, especially in the nineties, early two thousands, it was each team had so many heavyweights it was almost like you didn't have to fight. I mean, it was already, <laughs> there was already three or four assigned that game that night. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't something that had to happen very often. So yeah, you were too busy putting the puck in the net anyway, so it didn't matter. Uh, <laughs> what's your uh, take? And I, I try to ask this to uh, the majority of the players that come on and some guys want to leave it and some guys don't want to talk about some guys, just whatever. Uh, and it's up to you. Um, but actually, James McEwen, who you played with, I don't know if you know this, uh, but he's actually the face of the class action lawsuit against the CHL uh, for concussions. And uh, I wasn't aware of it until too long ago. I put my name on it, um, mostly just to get the information uh, to support these guys, um, not because I want to attack the CHL by any means. I'm not trying to get money or say that I need money because I have concussions or anything like that. Um, but what is your take on fighting in the game um, and the whole concussion thing? Uh, did you experience concussions? Um, and if so, do you think there's any long-term effects for you? Do you know guys that are suffering? Uh, what's your whole take on all that? Um, I don't think I had any concussion. I mean, maybe one or two. Um, so from that standpoint, I consider myself lucky. I know a lot of players um, are really battling, you know, tough situations with the concussions. Um, I grew up loving fights. I mean, whether I was watching on TV, whether it was part of the game and that you were participating in, uh, I mean, there was nothing better. But now when you see a fight and it's, you know, if it's two bigger guys and they're hitting each other, you're kind of like, for me, it's kind of like, yeah, it's, 
it doesn't have the same appeal that it once did. And I think it's because obviously we know what can happen um, after you're done playing. So, uh, but I think most people, whether they were players, fans, coaches, GMs, trainers, doctors, I mean, you just probably didn't know back then what, what the long-term uh, effects were going to be. So I, I certainly, any anybody that played the game, whether it was in the CHL, the NHL, the American, wherever it may be that needs help, I, I, I think that they need to take the steps to to get that help. And if it means getting involved in lawsuits, whatever it may be, then that's, that, that's fine. I mean, there's, there's certainly something that, that needs to be done to help players that are suffering in these scenarios. So um, I, I don't, from that standpoint, I, I wouldn't join just because I, I think I'm relatively healthy and um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think that I have any concussion issues that I would need to pursue. So I wouldn't, but I certainly don't, I mean, feel bad for people that are taking those steps. I mean, if it's something that they feel they feel they need to do, then that's certainly, um, you know, that's certainly their right and their prerogative. But uh, even over the years, I I don't I I can't say that I've ever been involved with a team, whether it was the coach, um, a trainer who knewingly put put a player in harm's way. I mean, that just that just didn't happen. And um, I barely played. I mean, I think I was told to fight more from coaches than most of the other players were. They kind of knew their role. So I, I know there's a, a side to hockey that that gets a bad rap. And for whatever reason, I just never seem to be on those teams. Like I've never ha- I never played for a guy who would constantly send guys out to fight like that just never happened. Um, I never played on a team that had rookie initiations, rookie hazings, that kind of garbage. Like it just, it was almost when I hear these stories, I just think, Jesus, like what, what what hockey world is this? I, I never saw any of that. So, uh, but obviously it's out there. So, um, but for me, I kind of feel lucky from that standpoint that physically, mentally, um, you know, I'm in a good place. So, uh, but anybody that, you know, that has issues, obviously they, they, they need to take the steps that they, they have to, to, to try to get help. And so I don't, uh, I don't have any, uh, any issues with that at all. Yeah. I tend to agree with what you say there as well. And, um, you know, I had a lot of concussions and I deal with, uh, some things, but at the same time, I don't know if that's concussions plus all the, my addiction, the, the drugs. Cause I, my addiction was just so insane. Kimby, I couldn't even begin to tell you where, where, where I was the last 10 years. So it's hard for me to kind of tell. So that's kind of my reasoning for not why I wouldn't take any compensation. My reasoning for, uh, signing up, uh, is so that, uh, more, you know, information gets brought to light there's uh, more recognition for this um and that there is more support for players because what i'm finding is that uh we all have the same goal or we had the same goal uh to pl- make it to the nhl and to have a long successful nhl career um and that rarely happens uh we talked about it on the on the podcast uh on the last podcast i forget what the numbers are but some small percentage of the actual numbers it's ridiculous like this the amount of players that make it to the whl ohl q that is small and then from there the nhl or whatever it just keeps getting smaller and smaller Um, and then to have any real support from the nhl pa you need to play however many games it is 400 or two i don't know what the exact number is but something astronomical uh and most guys never get there most guys never even get to play one game but all these guys are putting themselves on the line putting their bodies on the line uh through major junior through the east coast league through the ahl um and then when they're done uh there's no support for them and that to me uh or if there is uh it's not extremely readily available or out there because I've been trying to find it. Uh, there's a lot of great organizations and a lot of good people trying to do things, but as a whole, like as an organization, uh, as far as like, say the PHPA or, uh, the CHL or any, just hockey Canada, all of it. Um, I don't know who should be responsible. Uh, but people are making money off, uh, junior hockey and stuff. Uh, maybe not all teams because some are community based, but there are some people that are making money um, off kids uh, going out there and essentially whatever. We're all out there trying to make, 
live out our dream of making it to the NHL. And we know that if we're not out there, there's a thousand other kids that are willing to do it. So it's kind of a catch 22, but at the same time, when it all doesn't work out, where the hell is the support? And that is my big question. Yes. There's the alumni, the Swift Current Broncos alumni. I'm a part of Colin Rockets alumni. I'm a part of it's great. They're great organizations, but they're, they can only do so much. Where, where is everybody coming together to support uh, the people that really need it? Because the majority of the people won't need the help and the support. But there are a lot more people than people realize uh, that do need the support, Kimby. And there's been so many messages uh, from guys and also family members of guys uh, that have played hockey or whatever that have reached out. So uh, I tend to agree with you on that. But, um, you know, I think uh, we have a long ways to go with it. But we're definitely heading in the right direction with uh, all the information that's coming out Um What's next for you, really? Like, if you said that, um, you know, right now you're not looking at the hockey thing. I know you're enjoying uh, spending time with your kids up there in Alaska, but do you have any uh, short-term or long-term goals? Um, what has Kimby Daniels really been doing for the last 10 years? <laughs> just uh, just enjoying life up here, living. Um you know, you know, for me, I, I've kind of closed the book on, on, on hockey, being involved in hockey anyways. I mean, I still play in that, uh, on my men's league team, which is awesome, but watch my son play as much as I can. So, um, other than that, I just, you know, I imagine I'm going to stay up here, live up here. And, and, um, I, you know, I was obviously born and raised in Canada, but I don't necessarily miss it. I don't envision myself moving back at some point. So, um, but for me, it's just kind of enjoying my time up here. And, uh, you know, that may change when my kids get older, they may not stay in Alaska, they may move. I mean, so who knows, maybe that would be that that would be something that would get me to move. But, uh, you know, for the time being, I, I'm enjoying it up here, enjoying what I do. So it's, uh, you know, no need to, to try to make a make a drastic change anytime soon. Yeah, like I said, too, it is so beautiful up there. And you mentioned it's the closest thing to Canada, I think, as the States. And it's almost like you're in your whole – it's almost like a whole – it's own country, its own world up there because it's, you know, you can't get to anything else about Canada or whatever. I'm pretty sure you can see Russia from one spot. I'm not even <laughs> sure. But it's it's really, really beautiful up there. Um, you know, I feel very fortunate that I was even able to get up there. If anybody gets a chance to go up there, like do it because it, it really is breathtaking. I have a couple other questions, uh, before I let you go, um, typical questions that I like to ask guys when I do remember, um, who is the best player in your opinion that you played with or against, um, that really just was like, wow, either a guy that you were looking forward to playing with or against that was even better than you expected. Or somebody that just really surprised you that you just were just like wow. Um, I would the best player I ever saw or played against was Mike Medano, and he my first year in Swift Current. When you talk about those even strength goals, it was the way our team was set up. Um, I would play against the other team's best players, and their team liked that matchup, thinking, "Well, yeah, we'll play him against a sixteen-year-old," and and. But for me, it was, I, I had played defense. I was a defenseman until I was 15. So oh, wow. I ended up moving to forward when I went to Swift Current. So I understood how to play a defensive side of the game. So I, I played against like Mike Medano, Mike Sillinger, like all the top end guys when I was 16. And he ended up breaking his wrist in the all-star game. I think he had, he might've had a hundred points in his first 30 some games. He was on pace to, to be probably the second guy to get to 200 points. And I mean, we were so much better than they were, but him alone, what he made, he was an equalizer. They came into Swift Current. We only lost one game at home that year. And that was to Prince Albert. I think we lost three, two, and he had two goals and an assist. I mean, he was, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, that guy could skate like the wind with the puck. I mean, we know a lot of guys that can skate fast without it, but I mean, he, he had that thing going full speed. So he was probably the best player I had ever played against that I'd ever seen live. And uh, obviously I played a few times against Mario Lemieux. I mean, he, he obviously is the best, in my opinion, the best player ever. But yeah. um, when you take that him out of the equation, then it would probably be Madonna when I played against him in junior. What a cool story. I love to hear stuff like that. Uh, I almost <laughs> forgot that he played in PA 
Um, I didn't even think uh, that you would have been playing against him in that time. That's awesome. He really was uh, phenomenal. Uh, the only thing I don't like about him is he's not Canadian, but um, <laughs> but that's okay. which is surprising. He would go there from Michigan. He would go to some little northern Saskatchewan town. So I know was, actually uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Dan Gender, is actually the assistant coach there. Uh, he played with me in Victoria actually as well. Yeah, um, I, I actually spoke to him last night. Uh, he's going to come on the podcast soon. Uh, but yeah, he's uh, living in PA now. I was texting him last night. Uh, what the hell are you doing in PA while COVID nineteen is going on? Not too much. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. And uh, the last thing I want to ask you uh, before, uh, maybe one or two more things. But the la- one thing I do want to ask you is: Is there uh, one thing? And I, I don't like to be the guy to be like, oh, uh, uh, what a shoulda coulda, but. Um, is there one time or one thing in your hockey career, one moment um, that you think really, aside from the injury, I mean like a choice that you made um, that would have affected your career uh, in a negative way or essentially in a positive way? Is there a decision that made that really uh, helped your career? No, I think the one thing I played in Seattle briefly when the uh, when the NHL was on strike, and it was I, I don't even know. I, I was funny. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, I went down, played in Seattle, uh, played well. We played um, in the first. We were hosting the Memorial Cup, so an automatic berth into the Memorial Cup. We won the first round and then lost in the second round. So there was probably 30, 30 to 40 days we had off. And um, we had a meeting, team meeting the next day. And I walk into the rink and the assistant coach grabs me and says, hey, can I talk to you? I was like, yeah, sure. Um, I go into this, this room and it was like, I open the door and I'm like, you know, this doesn't look good. It was the coach, the general manager, the assistant general. And I lived with the assistant general manager. So this is how fucked up this story is. So <laughs> basically they said, the coach, Peter Anholt said, um, yeah, we're going to take a week off and then we're going to start practicing again, but we don't want you to come back. And I, I, I personally couldn't stand the guy. Like, it, it, he just was a tool bag. Yeah. So I said, okay, well you owe me some money. You got my money and they had an envelope ready, gave me the money. And I went home and packed my stuff and drove back to Swift Current. And I I think in hindsight, I probably should have maybe stayed and asked, Hey, what, like, why would you be sending me home? Like what, uh, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't broke any rules. I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad teammate. Um, and really what it came down to was I was smarter than he was and he didn't like it. And you know, that he was a guy that, I mean, if I were playing on that team, we may not have won the Memorial Cup. I'm not saying we would have, but their chances would have been better. I mean, yeah. that's for sure. So um, so that's one thing that I, I regret because then I think it, you know, people view it as, oh, you got kicked off a team. Like, why would, I, why would they kick you off a team that close to the Memorial Cup? So for me, that's always um, been an issue that I, that's bothered me over my career and, um Dennis Bayak was the assistant general manager. I lived, that's who I lived with. I lived at his health house with him and his wife. And he was like, man, I, I mean, I don't even know what to tell you. Like it's, I, uh, it's out of my hands. I can't, I can't, I can't do anything. And then I saw, uh, I don't, he became an agent, Carlos Sosa. He was the radio guy. He may have been an agent back then. I saw him a few years later at a rink and I was watching a game in Lethbridge and, he was like, yeah, you know, for whatever it's worth, I just, you know, I think he got a really raw deal. And, you know, in hindsight now, I'm like thinking, well, yeah, I mean, well, if you had really thought that, why didn't you do something about it? You know what I mean? Like, so it, uh, but other than that, you know, that was kind of the only regret I had. I just, you know, I just, before I could even sleep on it, I, I went home, packed my stuff and left. Like I was gone three hours later. So maybe if I had stayed for a couple of days and, you know, try to find an answer or whatever, you know, would have allowed me to play another in another Memorial cup, which would have been a, you know, for me, a good experience. So, um, but when I went home, I got back to swift current and, um, I talked to the, the manager of the flyers at the time. And he was like, as far as they didn't give us a reason why, and as far as we're concerned, your season's over. So I just said, all right, works for me. <laughs> so, so that was the end of it. But, uh, yeah, I certainly didn't like, uh, like how it went down. 
Yeah, I mean, and at the same time, people forget that uh, you're just a young man at that, you know, 20, 19, 18, 19, 20 years old, uh, really just a kid. And uh, a lot of these times, uh, you know, nowadays it's a little bit better, but that's a, it seems like a pretty unfair situation. Um, but at the same time, you can't change it. And really, at the end of the day, you had uh, such a successful career. Um, you did make it to the NHL. Uh, maybe you didn't play as long as you wanted to, but you, you played, um, hockey for a lot longer, um, than most guys get to professionally uh, by a long shot. So, um, that's uh, quite the accomplishment. You won a couple camp championships. You won an Allen cup, which is like the oldest trophy in like <laughs> all of sports. Like that is on my bucket list, but I don't think I ever want to play hockey again. So I don't know how I'm ever <laughs> going to win it if I don't play. Maybe I'll coach. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I know. I just think that's really cool. So uh, Kimmy, I'm going to wrap this up because it's been an hour. Listen, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this and, and coming on. I'm going to post the article um, that that guy wrote on, on you a few years back. I think everyone should read it. Um, it's just such a great story. Uh, thanks again, man. Uh, it was lots of fun and, uh, actually get to have a conversation with you, not chirping back and forth on the ice. Which was nice. <laughs> yep, for sure. Thanks for having me on. Um, glad you're doing well. Love listening to the podcast, love listening to, to other players, you know, guys that I've get cross paths with, whether it was as teammates or just playing against them a few times. It's, it's, you know, that's, what's great about this podcast generation we're in now. You can kind of catch up to, to people that, uh, that you haven't seen in years and, and find out how they're doing. So that's, that's awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And we'll be in touch, Kimmy. Uh, can't wait uh, to talk to you again and uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. All right. Sounds good. You have a good one. I know it's, I know it's getting late there. <laughs> Just want to say thanks again to hockey legend Kimby Daniels. That was uh, awesome. I can't tell you guys uh, enough what a neat experience it was uh, for me to get to play against him in my very first professional hockey career game um, with the Victoria Salmon Kings. And uh, I only played two shifts my first game uh, because I was so tired from uh, the seven game series uh, that we lost in Kelowna. Uh, and I went there the very next day and they needed me to play to get me on the playoff roster but I just needed to play a shift I ended up playing like two shifts um, but I played the next night and I actually scored the game winner then I played the next night and scored again um, so you know that was against Kimby and um, you know he was a lot older than me I was 21 he was at the end of his career but it was a really neat experience just having that hockey card growing up uh, that nasty mullet of his and uh, just getting a chance to talk to him on a on a human level now uh, off the ice after that little interaction we had back in 2008 2009 uh, was really really nice so thank you to him again um, I hope you guys enjoyed that and uh, I didn't really hear any feedback um, on the last podcast when I read um, one of my journal entries um, but I figured uh, I'm gonna do it again right now again I swear to God I haven't read it other than uh, just the first sentence uh, just to see uh, where it was this is not a continuation from the last one uh, like I said I don't know what it said so I'm just gonna keep reading um, hopefully there's nothing too too bad in there I don't think there is because that's not really my style of writing um, but who knows because again, this is when I was in jail um, and uh, You know, I wrote uh, I wrote quite a bit so I'm gonna take a drink of water here and uh, We'll get I'm gonna get going on reading this. I hope you guys enjoy it All right My dream of playing professional hockey started the moment I put skates on. All those hours spent on the street and in my carport trying to re recreate what I saw on TV, Rock'em Sock'em, the famous Don Cherry series allowed me to re rewind so I could see exactly the move or the shot those guys were doing. It's not like today with so much access with the likes of YouTube. I was very lucky. My dad collected all sorts of movies, and we had any hockey VHS he could get his hands on. When I watched, uh, when I watched, I almost always had my stick in my hand, 
and a golf ball to practice my stick handling. My hands, as it's called in the world of hockey, always stood out as one of my best attributes. A lot of goalies I played with always pointed to me when asked who the hardest to stop on a breakaway was. The most compliments came from a good goalie in Travis Yonkman when I was playing with the Broncos. An all around great guy who I had the pleasure of playing with in Swift Current over parts in three seasons. I do believe that I had some natural athletic ability, but I know how many hours I spent on that street, in that carport, and in my basement, and I also know how much I enjoyed it, purely, with all my heart. It had all my focus and all my energy, or sorry, and all my energy was owned by my dream, but deep down, I would never actually let myself believe I could ever be good enough. When a stick was in my hand, it's like I went into a different world. As much as I loved the game of hockey and the speed and intensity of a real game, I never loved it as much as being free on or off the ice with a stick in my hands. Growing up, I was fortunate that my dad took me to three or four, three or four Canuck games a year, and we were always there before the warm-up started. As a young kid, and even as a pro, the warm-up was my favorite part of playing. I loved the music. As a player, I would always sing along. My last two years in Swift Current, I picked the songs for warm-up and gave them to the music guy. Same thing for the second half of the year and in playoffs for the Kelowna Rockets. There was something about it, all of it. I loved connecting with the fans during warm-up. I'd skate by the young kids, lean up on the glass, and turn my head and flash him a big old Bobby Clark smile revealing my four missing front teeth. As I was singing, I'd flip or toss multiple pucks over the glass to the waiting kids, always thrilled, usually high-fiving each other after they scored, usually running to their parents with excitement. I never forgot being that young boy on the other side of the glass. Though I was too focused on what move or technique I could pick up, I was never really worried about getting a puck. I was trying to see how I could one day be there myself. I was never a huge fan of practices, but I loved the first minutes prior to drills and the shootout at the f and free time once the practices were done. Hockey was my drug, and my stick was my syringe. Once I had uh, put on my or so, sorry, once I had a puck on my stick, it was like pushing the plunger on a syringe and administering the greatest drug straight into my bloodstream. Um, that was from August 9th. Uh, sorry, I forgot to say that. So this is continued from August 10th. Uh, people always want to know how. That is a hell of a qu Oh, That is a hell of a lot of more... Sorry. That is a hell of a lot more complex and convoluted question than I've ever cared to tell anyone in detail. Certainly no one knows the whole story. Until now, I haven't even been completely upfront and open with myself about everything that's tra transpired in the first 32 years of my life. Thus far, it's been a wild up and down series of manic outbursts. I've hit some amazing highs, no pun intended, and extreme lows. During it all, struggling to find true happiness, trying to find balance. When I was 23, I met a guy named Kai Hainonen. This guy is a weapon and a guy I could Sorry, and a guy I could have eas and could have easily guided me to the elusive balance and happiness that I've been searching for my entire life. Like everything else to date, I sabotaged that as well. I don't need anyone to tell me that I'm not winning at life. I spent the better part of the last four years behind bars. I still have trouble digesting how aggressively my life has been overcapacitated by a steady flow of drugs and crime. Getting arrested, being in court, and living the daily routine of jail is now suddenly, or maybe actually not suddenly, the new normal. When fueled by drugs and crime, I have no concept of anything else. Time is what I'm losing. I'm eight days away from my 32nd birthday. How did I get this old? How have I not seen Brooklyn and Brody since early 2015? Almost five years. How could I deny, and again I have to leave the name blank because I'm not going to use the name, blank and blank, the, the kid and the girl. 
Why was I such a coward when she got pregnant? There's a list of a thousand things I never imagined myself doing. Some good, but the ones that I couldn't in my worst nightmare see myself doing, or even worse, led me to becoming a menace to myself and society. There were times when I was homeless on Hastings, and I'd have random thoughts about how my life could have been the last time I cleaned up, the time Kai was in my life. As I sit there in the pouring rain in front of North America's first, but greatly successful at saving people, very first safe injection site called Insight, and only one, ablo and only one block away from the Cordova, Cordova Detox Center. A place that saw me go through the doors four or five different times. The first three trips to that particular detox never ended up with me walking out the doors and hitting the block, which is Hastings. The fourth time was different. I had been to detox on nine or ten occasions by this time. It's pretty much the same everywhere I went. I saw the walls of four different detoxes, all in BC. Cordova detox four times, Vancouver detox three times, Crossroads Kelowna in Kelowna a couple times, and Creekside in Surrey a couple times. I guess one might say I've done the tour. Each one had a thing or two different from the next. My first eye-opening journey to the world of recovery was at Crossroads when I went on a wild and intense retreat to Kelowna with my friend Justin. This was a life-altering decision that ended with my fiance Brittany calling off our wedding. As I'll allude to it later in my writings, Brittany's aunt and uncle live in the outskirts of Kelowna, and I was very fortunate to establish a very strong bond with them during my final season in the Western Hockey League playing with the Kelowna Rockets, one of my best years ever on the ice. Shelley and Kurt are their names, uh, and their daughter... Uh, Taya live in Joe Rich, which is a breathtaking area off of Highway 33, just outside of Kelowna. They have a gorgeous and unique house built by legendary architect Arthur Erickson. It's situated on t 10 square acres with creekside access at the back of the property. Kurt punched a hole, punched a road into the side of the cliff. 4x4 slash ATV access only, right down to their very own campsite on the creek. The house is a one of a kind with a gated driveway, racquetball court, and a massive deck with a with a hot tub. The back of the house is all glass, looking out to the beautiful mountains. This was this was my dream house. Their neighbors were even great. All the guys met often on their quads, cross the creek, and ride the trails that never seemed to end. There's something special about that area. There's something different, and I could feel it. It was I was instantly drawn towards it. On top of all that, I came very fond of Shelly, Kurt, and Taya. Shelly had known Brittany since she was in diapers. She dated Britt's dad's brother in the 80s and her, had remained close to her family ever since. I respect Shelly and was grateful for her kindness and generosity she gave me throughout the entire season. Brittany, Brittany spent the majority of her pregnancy, especially the final trimester in Kelowna with me, and, or sorry, when I wasn't on the road. I don't know how many times she made that drive back and forth four hours, three if she was driving, between Port Coquitlam and Kelowna. I broke curfew every night. Brittany was in Kelowna, staying with her and Shelly and Kurt at their beautiful house, 40 minutes away from my billets. By this time, my relationship with my sister Brittany had been completely destroyed, and the greatest loss of all was the closeness with my niece Kaylin. That had, that had a big influence on how I... Uh, took to their daughter Taya. She was a doll, born premature, under two pounds. She was really small, still at five years old, but she was a fearless princess, uh, fearless princess warrior. She helped me with the loss of Kaylin due to our stupid f fighting, which was and still is constant. I'm talking about my sister there. Kurt became like an older brother I never had. I admired him. He carries a certain type of charisma. I've seen very little, or sorry, certain carries a certain type of charisma I've seen very little of. We got off to a rough start, but it was uh, inevitable uh, that we would eventually hit it off. And it was easy to see myself, or, or be myself around him, and I really listened whenever he spoke. 
I had a lot of fun by his side. Once all the dust, dust had settled and the drama that unfolded the, earlier that summer leading up to me basically moving in with them. Uh, Kurt is originally from Saskatchewan, the province I spent the majority of four years in, 03 to 07, playing with the Swift Current Broncos. He was in the agricultural and transportating industry and had some young guys from the small town of Swift Current working for him. And he had mentioned to one of them that his niece was dating one of the Swift Current Broncos. Uh, during a time when he was driving through this uh, town of Port Coulomb in the summer, uh, he had called Brittany's mom, Debbie, to pay back some money that he had borrowed on a previous trip. Debbie called Brittany and I and asked if we would meet him uh, to pick up the money. Brittany and I, along with our friends Matt and Nicole, were headed to the movie Knocked Up with Seth Rogen. Uh, Debbie suggested that Brittany and I just go on our own um, because Uncle Kurt uh, might get uh, weirded out if other people were there. Um, little did I know, um, he actually knew that this girl from Swift Current was pregnant and Brittany didn't know at the time. Um, so anyways, Brittany got out of the car, proceeded to go into his truck and uh, came out and she was crying and I said, what's wrong? And she said, so-and-so was pregnant. Um, and that's how she found out that girl was pregnant. Um, again, I will say, Brittany and I were not together when that girl got pregnant. Um, so it was nothing like that, but uh, I did lie to her. Um, well, I didn't lie to Brittany. I just never told her that she was pregnant. Uh, that pregnant, uh, I did tell her that I was seeing this girl. Um, but uh, and then shortly after this, Brittany got pregnant. Uh, but I'm going to cap the reading there. Uh, I will continue uh, reading this story on the next podcast because I'm actually curious as to what I wrote, and I'm not going to read it. Uh, I put it down. Uh, I'll continue reading it on episode 21. Uh, so guys, thank you so much. Please head over to HockeyToHeroin.com, um, sign up uh, for the contest, Team Issue Contest, Sunday nights, 9 p.m., live Facebook stream, Taylor will be taking over that, I'm really excited for her to be doing that, um, she hasn't been able to, to do much, she's been really sick with this pregnancy, so I think that's an excellent outlet for her, I'm really excited uh, for her to be taking the reins on this, uh, also guys, HockeyToHeroin.com, um, please, 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 if you want to be part of the Puck Support Foundation, uh, we need your help to get it off the ground. Um, not financially at this point, um, just with uh, people's experience uh, and expertise. So once again, I appreciate it, guys. Please, wherever you're listening to, subscribe, like, share. If you did like it, if you didn't, I'll say it again, don't. <laughs> uh, but I hope you did, and I really, truly appreciate all the support. And please, guys, uh, on my website, leave me a voice message. I can't wait to... Uh, play them back on future episodes. Take care and remember, have a great day if you so choose.